things on? Okay. This morning's text features people in a tough spot with hard questions. What did I dream? What does it mean? No king has ever been asked such a thing of mere mortals, the text tells us, right? Crisis. For the last 11 days, the U.S. House of Representatives has not had a Speaker of the House. Unprecedented. Just like the king's dream. What to do. All the powerful people in the room, in the kingdom, are on edge wondering what happens next. The book of Daniel was written a long time ago. We know this. It's an ancient text. It was written in a style called apocalyptic. And it works like this. Even though it looks like the evil king is in charge, the truth is that God is in charge. So this allows us to live confidently in the present, knowing that we will not necessarily escape suffering or pain or trial. But in the end, we know where the story is going that it's going to be brought to a good conclusion because the truth is that God is in charge no matter how bad the crisis appears. But God pulled a Daniel in my life, and it took me a few decades to notice. My whole life, I've lived in a market-driven, capitalistic economy where competition is good. In fact, we count on competition to bring out the best in people, invention and strategy and creativity and so on. So for decades now, I have hated this reality because I thought, why doesn't cooperation bring out the best in humanity? That seems more like how God has made humans to shine. A week ago, Sunday in the evening, Jen and I were driving home from a Covenant Church's 20th anniversary over in Detroit. I said something to her about my love-hate relationship with competition. And I was telling her how earlier this year someone asked me why after 12 years I remain a pastor when the job conditions get tougher and tougher each year. I said, it brings out the best in me and it surfaces the worst in me. And in that moment, God revealed the mystery that was right there under my nose. God was making my little dream come true. Not by changing the economic system I live in, not by relocating me to another location, but through my very life's work. It's a good thing Jen was driving because I was crying. Even though I didn't have a clue, God's wisdom and power were happening in my little life over those decades. God often has a bigger plan that we cannot see. As Wendy Witter notes, the stories of Daniel show that it is God alone who has wisdom and power and both are God's to give and to take. The key assumption of the book of Daniel is not that there is a God in heaven. Everybody believed this. John Golden Gay notes the difference is that this God reveals secrets. As we heard, God revealed the mysterious dream and its meaning to Daniel in a nighttime vision. Today we're going to focus in on a single verse from chapter 2. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked him for more time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now, hang on. I don't remember God inviting Daniel into this. I didn't hear a promise from God that, Daniel, don't worry, I will give you the interpretation. All I heard is that a death squad was on the prowl. And this guy in exile has the nerve to march into the king and make a promise like that? What would you have done? Kind of reminds me of Esther. If you know that story, she goes into the king unannounced on penalty of death. It reminds me of Moses going into Pharaoh without an appointment or a clear direction on how he's going to save the people. Stephen Covey would not like these failures. We did not begin with the end in mind here. Daniel, Esther, Moses, they acted trusting God's power and wisdom. They took a risk, a huge risk. And that's because God's wisdom and power empower us to take risks. As Dr. Tim Mackey of the Bible Project talked on 
last week's podcast, there's this scriptural theme of the chaos dragon. Who said the Bible was boring? The dragon is not the cosmic threat to God, but it will play a cosmic threat to creation itself unless the humans learn how to trust in God's wisdom and power to rule over the beast. By the way, the first time we see the chaos dragon would be the serpent in the garden in Genesis 3. But Mackie notes, learning to trust God's wisdom and power. Did you notice that those were the very words that Daniel sings in his praise song after God gives him the vision? He says, praise to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He gives wisdom to the wise. I thank and praise you, God, and my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. Now remember, Daniel offers this praise after God acts. But he marches into that king asking for more time without any directive from God, without any prayer time, without any plan. Don't forget, Daniel took action before God had done anything. God's wisdom and power empower us to take risks. But I'm not saying don't just take risk for risk's sake. Over and over across the entire Bible, the people of God are invited to put more of their weight, even their entire life, like Daniel and Esther, on this God. This is how we learn to trust God's wisdom and God's power. It's not by reading books or singing songs or doing Bible studies or hearing sermons. Those are all fine. But God's wisdom and power empower us to take risks. And only in the risk do we find that our faith gets stronger. I have talked a lot about what church is not. Does anyone recognize this place in Ada? From the website. The Ada Indoor Country Club is a members-only private indoor golf simulator and bar experience. Do we have any members in the house today? Just kidding. I would love to go. I want to see how the golf simulators work in there. But I worry this, that, that a country club is, is something that people think of church these days. This is a list that Pastor Julia, Pastor Lynn, and I just brainstormed a few weeks ago. Church is not neat and tidy answers. And the other things you can see that are up there. But this morning, I want you to imagine with me what church could be. Some of us pastors in Grand Rapids were asking and wondering the very same thing a year ago. We were coming out of COVID in the heat of the pandemic, and the Colossian Forum launched this project called Sowing Seeds of Hope. There were two questions that we were going to pursue the Holy Spirit in. One, is there hope for the church during an era filled with division and polarization? And two, can the church really, can the church really provide an embodied alternative that matters for our fragmented and fractured world? This felt like foolishness at first. We did not know where this thing was going. Everybody knew it. We were building the plane while flying it, as we said so much in those years. Well, today, today I want to invite you, Thorn Apple, into this project with us. I had a lot of hesitations as this project took off. Everything was being recorded. Some of it was out of my own fear. I hate being misrepresented. It took me a long time to trust that this was not reality TV and I was gonna be cast into some stereotypical role. Some of it was my shepherding instinct. I know that God is taking thorn apple to new pastures and I didn't want a project or a documentary to get in the way of that. We are the last church that this film crew has visited. And this visit, this very visit, sort of fell into place. Uh, when the producer asked me 10 days ago if I happened to be preaching today because they were going to be in town, and I said, yes, I am. Please come. 
I believe Thornapple is doing something good among us. We're ready to lean a little more on to God's wisdom and power. Bearing witness to God's good and gracious work in Grand Rapids is a story worth sharing before the 2024 presidential election, wouldn't you agree? Well, one of the great people working with the Colossian Forum on this project is here with us this morning. Her name is Jenny Steele, and I'm going to invite her forward to join me. Jenny has a knack for gathering people together. She is so good at it. And so a year ago, last October, she invited all 16 of these people to gather for a morning, a morning breakfast at Lucy's up, up on Plainfield. Two of us showed up. Guess which who? Yeah, you're looking at us. We were there, didn't, weren't we, Jenny? And it was so good. Uh, and that day, I did something weird. I did something I don't often do. I took a risk, and I recorded our conversation on my iPhone. And as I was preparing this sermon, I was cleaning up my old voice memos, and I came across this. And I want you to hear how God had started simmering today's sermon in our souls way back then. Okay, go. So where do you think, where do you want the church to be in 10 years? Your church. Thor Thornapple in, in 10 years. It's so hard with that thing rolling. <laughs> Thornapple in 10 years would be a, a, a people who, in all their different comings and goings in life, so on the, on the sideline of the soccer game, in the office, in the neighborhood, at school, wherever they are, they, they would be like this uh, positive presence, this somehow ability to, to channel or to bring some bit of good blessing, gifting from God to their friends, to their family, to their coworkers. And it, it, it isn't by having all the answers. It's by being able to sit with people in the hard questions. It's, it's not that they've got formulas, it's that they actually bring wisdom because I think all these situations are so unique and everybody just wants a formula. And I'm, I'm tired too, Jenny. Like it, it takes a lot of energy to have to wrestle out each situation, but it seems like that's what our world is, all these sort of customized situations. Like I said earlier, I don't care so much that they would know that it's thorn apple, but somehow that they would know that it's because we have this, this God who's, who's with us and who gives us these real powers, real power, <laughs> powers like we're <laughs> like something else but this power to like shape and change and affect affect our lives because I don't think anybody else is, is, is doing that wisdom and power not superpowers as we sort of giggled on there but the power of God here's another one it, has, it was leaving space for, it was Inviting people to be comfortable with the questions. Yes. Um, Offering wisdom. That is a, that is a yeah. thing that keeps rising up more and more. And in these in these relationships that are that are based on on kind of on honesty, vulnerability, confession. Not because <clears throat> not because it's like a, um, what do you do that like a cathartic exercise, but because we're so in touch with our own sin, brokenness, shame, all this crap, and so also in touch with the amazing love, grace, yeah. redemption, forgiveness of God, that we're actually able to talk about both in just crazy measures. Yeah. We talked about being wildly loved the first time. Wildly loved? Yeah. But it's, that people can know their brokenness and yeah. like be vulnerable in that and be real in that, but also invite the space of just being wildly loved. Yes. And, um, yeah, leaving that as a place for people to feel in their questions, in their struggles. That's another thing you talked about the first time, is like whatever struggles people are going through. Right, that we're a helpful guide yes. in that. That's right, the word guide. Yep. Yes. Um, and not, not that we come with the answers, I said that, not that we're answer women and men, yep. but that we are able to help people. Because everybody's, maybe that's part of it too, Jenny, that I love to fix things, you do too. I love to give answers to solve problems, but. Just to sit with them in it. Will we risk demonstrating to our neighbors that they are wildly loved 
by joining them in the wrestle, in the muck and mud with whatever questions they're facing. One question that has haunted Thornapple in a good way, in the best way, in a Holy Ghost sort of way for the past several years is if Thornapple were to disappear, would anyone notice? The wrestle is probably where most of the learning and transformation and growth happens. So, and that's where I talked about how I, in in what you described the first time, I just heard space. I heard yeah, space to wrestle, space to question. Yeah. That if the folks from the church weren't there anymore, yeah, there'd be a void. Right. I mean, people would feel that absence and they would miss but it. But why? 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 What would they miss? What would they miss? They would miss feeling safe. They would okay. miss feeling seen. Good. They would miss being reassured that they're loved, even in the midst of their brokenness. Good. Wildly loved. I would say they couldn't, they, they would be uh, less in touch with reality if the Christians weren't there, because we all deceive and fool ourselves so much of the time. Like, we would be kind of known as... Uh, gracious truth tellers or humble truth tellers not like beat you over the head yeah. truth tellers but you know what I mean yeah yeah I, I would say too that without Christians we um, we wouldn't be like forward leaning we wouldn't be like with Christians there we would be more willing to take risks we would be more willing to do wild things we'd be more willing right to like take on big projects not because of profit not because of politics, but because something bigger, like a love for people, uh, uh, a sharing of, of of goodness, of kindness. Yeah, isn't that wild that we would be like... The we'd Christians be like, would be the risk takers? Right, 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 right. Risk. Are we Christians becoming more avoidant of it, or are we embracing it more and more? Are we making room for others in our lives? Is our reputation as gracious and humble truth-tellers increasing? Over the past year, at least, a dream for Thornapple has been taking root in my soul. It's fumbling. We are, you hear a live conversation. We're making this up as we go, but I want to share it with you this morning. It is that Thornapple would be the best group of people in all of Cascade to wrestle life's hardest questions with. We are not selling fire insurance here to keep people out of hell. We are not social justice warriors trying to build the kingdom of God. We are an embodied alternative such that God's wisdom and power empower us to take risks. What might this look like, you ask? I wonder the same thing. It's hard to describe something when you can't see it all. You can't begin with the end in mind. But my sense is that it's going to be in the ordinary rhythms of our lives. I'm thinking of church in smaller forms and more scattered, where every square inch of our lives and 168 hours of our week are part of it. Every bit of my existence is the work of the church, and that's not because I'm a pastor. It's because I belong to the kingdom of God. Jenny, would you be willing to tell us a little bit how being and doing church has looked a little different for you. Good morning. It is a privilege to be here with you this morning. I never dreamed in a million years a year ago when I extended an invite to have breakfast with the pastors that this would be where things ended up, but it's, um, it's a gift to be here with you today. I wanted to share a little bit about a, a journey that my family took. Um, we go to church about 25 minutes away from our house, but we have a deep love for our neighbors and our neighborhood. And so we wanted to create a space for our neighbors where folks who may not step foot into a church or who had been hurt by the church in different ways or um, who just felt isolated or lonely could have a place to belong. And feel home and so we decided to open up our home on Sunday nights a number of years ago and just invite anybody in who wanted to come we would keep it simple everybody brought a dish we talked about what we were thankful for sometimes we would talk about where we saw God but we mainly just shared joys and struggles and questions and we shared life together um, sometimes it would be 10 people or 20 people sometimes it would be 50 people with kids we never really knew, um, but it ended up being a really remarkable time for a number of different reasons. Um, 
as we were kind of exploring who would come to this, we kept it open and there was a family who walked through our neighborhood regularly. They didn't live in our neighborhood, but they walked their dogs there and I got to chatting with them one day and they, um, they just kind of expressed an interest to become more connected and so I said, well, we're doing this crazy thing, why don't you just come? And so they came, they brought their three boys and they started coming regularly and um, just we established a really beautiful relationship. And it was months later um, during a, a side conversation that the mom said to me, she said, you know, I, I need to tell you something. And I said, well, you know, what? And she said, I, I want to thank you. You really changed the trajectory of our family. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? I just thought we were doing nachos and, you know, pizza or whatever else. And she said, we were having conversations about putting our house up for sale because the neighborhood that we live in, which is the neighborhood next to ours, people really keep to themselves. There, um, there just isn't much interaction at all. And she said, we were feeling so lonely and so isolated. And that's why we walked our dogs in your neighborhood because garage doors are open and people are out. And we were just looking for that. Um, but even then, we never got included in the neighborhood things. And um, she said, so when you invited us and, you know, now we, we have friends that are like family and we have things to look forward to. And um, she said, we have decided to stay and we're planning our roots here and we're a part of this. So what ended up happening in the years since, um, things shut down because of COVID, but those relationships are still the closest in all of our lives. And they have become dear mentors to my husband and I in terms of raising kids, their kids are older than ours. A lot of times their kids are better than ours, <laughs> but they're a little more well-behaved sometimes. But, but they just, they help us um, know how to do life and parenting, and I'm so grateful for that. So I don't know what risk-taking looks like for you. I'm an extrovert, and so I love gathering people, and that made sense for our family. It hey, be I'm going to say this part. You didn't we, didn't, we didn't practice this. Somebody take a picture. I want a picture while we're up here right now. Stay by me, Jenny. Jenny is part of the church, and she embodied an alternate way in her ordinary life. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? She churched in the most Jenny way possible. I wouldn't do that, but Jenny can't not do it. Thornapple, are we willing to wrestle life's hardest questions with our neighbors? The hardest questions of Daniel's day were pretty simple and straightforward. What did the king dream and what does it mean? I will summarize the rest of the chapter for you very simply. Daniel tells the king his dream and its interpretation. He gives God all the credit for revealing the mystery. And the king has no one killed and promotes Daniel and his Jewish friends. God's power and wisdom empower us to take risks. Now what about our world? What are the hard questions in our world? I want you to pull out your phone or a scrap of paper and I want you to jot down what comes to mind. Think about your friends, think about yourselves, think about your kids, think about your parents, think about your coworkers. What questions are people asking that are good, that are hard, that don't have simple answers, that are worth a wrestle, that need an answer, that need a guide? I'm just stalling for time. What questions are being asked in our world? I think there's something there. A holy invitation. And given time constraints, I want to say, from my perspective, I hear these questions surfacing in our world right now. How can I have inner peace? When my kids reject the church, what do I do? What does my life mean? Is there something more to all of this than just feeling good? If you're willing, I would love to know what you all are writing and brainstorming. So send it my way. As we close, people of God, Thorn Apple Covenant Church, God seems to be calling us to something different. And we might fail. But I think we're in good company because the Bible is chock full of stories of failure and rough starts and detours and reroutes. Have you read it? I learned recently that Google will fire you unless you fail 
two times a month. That's weird. The kingdom of God is weird. If I may be so bold, God is weird. Christians are weird. Because God's power and wisdom empower us to take risks. We are going to end our time this morning around God's word with the riskiest prayer that one could ever pray for God's wisdom and power. It's the prayer Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him, Lord, how should we pray? Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We invite you to stand as we sing together and welcome our kids back in.